Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How you doing today, Jack? I'm upset. I'm very upset. Uh oh, what happened? Proton Mail has me very upset. Talk is cheap. In I age. did see. Talk is so cheap. That was the very, very first thing you put on our intro items here. Yeah. So let's let's have I'm it not, out. What's I'm going upset. on? I, I want to ask you first how you're doing. Are you doing okay over there? Are you upset as I am? I'm bracing myself, uh, but uh, I am I am just as as ready to get upset as okay. you are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what are we getting upset we're about? We're getting upset about Proton Mail being liars. <laughs> That's what it boils down to. Uh-oh. So they receive. Uh oh. Yeah, I get it. Fine, coming from their side. Uh, Proton Mail is a Swiss company, and apparently under EU or Swiss laws, if they receive a legal request from, I think it's two or more EU countries, they have to retrieve log information, which is a load of crap. We'll just say, basically, what happened. So this company. So there was a. I think it was a French uh, reporter that was, I don't know what they were writing. They were writing whatever. It doesn't matter. The content doesn't matter. And essentially the French government was like, hey, we want to shut this person down. We need their IP address. And they went to ProtonMail and said, hey, we have their email. You need to provide us the IP logs of this this user, essentially. And ProtonMail on their website states, we do not log IP addresses. Well, sure enough, they got their request together. They sent it over to ProtonMail. ProtonMail just happily, just I'm, I'm sure not happily, but obliged and said, look, here's the IP information you're looking for. Here's Here you go, which... I don't know how you can do that as a security facing company that states on their site, we don't log any IP information. So I'm upset. Of course, you know, they write that they write this on their site. They get this request for information. They happily oblige to the government, hand it over. And, you know, two days later, guess what they take off their website, the logging about IP information. So I don't know. I, 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 it's, Another one of those things. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. So you can put anything you want out on the website, but if you're actually doing it, is it if you're doing it is a different thing. So what I have linked there in the show notes is the request uh, from Proton Mail from the government, basically. So I don't know. I'm upset. I'm not happy with it. Uh, being a user of Proton Mail, because essentially what you're paying for now is not the security of proton mail you're just paying for an email email provider so you, know, you can go anywhere for that yeah so i'm i'm following the thread on twitter which points to a reddit post by proton mail themselves talking about uh there was no possibility to appeal or fight this particular request because an act contrary to swiss law did in fact take place so they're talking about they are under the governance of swiss law and under in uh, the the under the swiss uh department of justice right uh which did a legal review of that case that was their final determination um they also include that in their transparency report um you know, a good stat here is they fought over 700 cases in 2020 alone, right? Um, but they they mentioned that this particular case could not be fought. But I think here, what's under investigation is not necessarily the legality of what goes on with the IP addresses, but or sorry, not not the legality of what goes on with what cases are fought and which cases are not fought. It's the uh, notification uh, or, or the misunderstanding that Proton Mail is not logging IP right. addresses. Um, there is, uh, in their transparency report here, uh, they say certain privacy rights can be suspended by the authorities. Uh, there's a legal basis there, uh, quote unquote, in extreme criminal, criminal cases. Uh, so at that point, 
they were complying with that. Now, the, the frustration is not being able to disclose that to the individual and saying, hey, by the way, your stuff's right. being monitored. And I get that. Right. Um, you know, you're not. I think it was mentioned they're they're not going to pay for your. I think it was described as mistakes, but they're not going to pay for your. Inju- I, I don't want to call it injustice. They're not going to pay for you to. You know, do do illegal things on their with their service is kind of what one of the arguments was yeah which i i get and that's something yeah and 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 just to just to spin this i mean that's something that is very interesting especially in the u.s right so so talking about um us are we hosting data are we selling someone else's services to host data what data do we have access to you know like when we talk about you know using using Nextcloud uh to run your business and operate stuff and 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 do that right how is that data being handled and who's going to have access to that data? And, you know, what, what can people come to us and and request, you know, Hey, by the way, we noticed some suspicious behavior on this IP address on DigitalOcean, and you are the owner of that specific droplet. Um, So we want to subpoena or do whatever, you know, as, 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 uh, is appropriate for that so there is there's there's a lot of interesting things when it comes to to data law unfortunately it's 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 being hashed out uh in the courts very slowly and um i would i would rather it be done in the courts than it be done in the uh the the law like the actual legislature uh because that's that's going to be a failure. Um, I, I cringe every single time someone passes a new law to do something else, right? I would rather just have it out in the court system and say, all right, well, this is obviously needs to be, you know, made a judgment on so we can use it as a, a basis for, you know, common law and, and, you know, to have, to have precedence, right. And to have, to have that judgment and, and to be able to appeal. Right. So, I mean, there's, there's definite, I'd say, advantages uh, to doing that and especially when it comes to to web hosting which has been around forever so there's there's good precedent established there right um as as well here i mean it sounds like proton mail was was logging what they needed to in the case that they provided a, a caveat for right and and unfortunately that caveat reared its ugly head in a in a scenario like this I, and and that's just that's just unfortunately how the cookie crumbles, I guess. Um, you you never think it's going to be used against you. You you never right. think, you know, it's it's going to be, it's going to be someone who doesn't deserve it, right? You, you, it's always for the kids. It's always you Climate. know. Um, I think it was this time for. Yeah, yeah, and and so there's there's. Rarely you think it's going to be used innocuously. And unfortunately, it, it, it does start to have its own type of scope creep into things that maybe aren't extreme criminal cases, right? And that's, I think, the one basis where Proton Mail should look at, at pushing back. And unfortunately, they're just a large company that handles a lot of these. And, and the one that their legal team did acquiesce to ended up being a huge deal, right? And sure. that's just the risk you take as, as a company providing these kind of services, especially Proton Mail, who's, who's very all up in arms about privacy and security. And, and yeah, they've done a, a great job. Unfortunately, just email just sucks. Totally. Right. Uh, so if, if you, if you want to do something, I mean, host a federated service. That's what they're for. I mean, the server is there, you know, to, to hide your IP and, and you can run your own email server too. I'm not saying you should. That's probably a terrible idea, but you know, Use a use a matrix account to to communicate with someone. Use something that's end to end encrypted because even here they say you know we can access your IP, you know the sender and the recipient and the message subject, right? Because that's all that's right. all in clear text to them, right? And and that's only encrypted email. Uh, most of it is going to be unencrypted email, so it doesn't even matter anyways, right? Whereas something uh, a a modern protocol. 
a uh, federated protocol like like the matrix spec with its various servers and client by the way which i didn't put here uh one of the rust servers is out of alpha into the beta stage so that's that's exciting to see uh, but you know use use something like that if you really want to take the next step in this i mean it's it, it, it's been argued before. I mean, why not just put backdoors in, in all our encryption? It's like, well, the, then the people you're trying to backdoor are right. not going to use that encryption. Like, it, it's it's real simple, right? You make you make arms illegal, and only the people who are willing to do illegal things get arms. And <laughs> so it's it's never a good argument uh, as far as as backdooring information like that. But um, it it looks like, unfortunately, you know, they just got caught up in the rigors of running a business. And that's that's the worst part about running a business like that. When you're just provide, trying to provide a, a good service and you get caught up in someone else's right. politics. And that's exactly what happened. And it sucks. But yep. I didn't know that stat that they had 700 cases in 2020 alone. That's crazy. That, that's crazy to me. I did yeah. not see that. You know, it's yeah. the one... It's the one that gets the attention, though, right? And it catches everyone's eye. Like, oh, hey, by the way, they said they weren't doing something, and that guess what they are? I'm still a Proton Mail user. I, you know, e- like you said, setting up email just is hard. It's it's not easy to do. It's not fun to do. It's just something easier to f- kind of farm away, farm to someone else. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But that's all I had for Proton uh, Mail there. I did have another one on, I don't know if I want to call it user usage, use cases. Uh, I I don't know if it falls under the same. I'm trying to merge it in here, get a nice uh, integration for this next point. But Docker is updating and extending their product subscriptions. I feel like every every quarter they come in with a new subscription model for, hey, our enterprises users are, we're charging this, our, you know, community users this so i think from docker pools to now it looks like docker usage on the desktop is just you know being mon being being monitored being uh I, they're starting to realize oh hey this is not as profitable as we thought let's start charging people for the service <laughs> so uh really the big change here that i saw was docker for desktop was they started the subscription model personal is free they have a pro model here uh five bucks a month and then the two the two big ones were team and business which kind of get uh, start to get expensive there start to get to the level of like GitLab. you know GitLab is one of those services that they charge i think a hundred bucks a month for uh per, per user. user now docker business it's 21 dollars per user per month for just a desk docker desktop experience now i'm sure you get you know su- the support with that and whatever but 21 bucks per user per month really adds up especially if you're a large company and you have you know tens of thousands i don't want to say tens of thousands thousands of developers that's not a cheap bill every month to pay for people to use docker so no real changes or updates for the personal users um but teams and enterprises something to be on the lookout for yeah uh i don't know why you would want to license a desktop application in 2021 that that just seems <laughs> well, backwards to uh, me. i think the i mean there's starting to become viable solutions it used to be just docker was out there but now you know you have podman and a couple other solutions yeah there you know people are really just starting to write their write their own at this point i saw a couple i was looking up you know alternatives and podman's a big one uh and then you just see some other people create these like docker clis which is essentially all you need is a container runtime and you know that's easy to get container d and then you need a CLI and people are just really starting to, you know, come out of the wood, pop out of the woodwork with these solutions for basically this. I don't know. I don't know if I'd call it a problem, but this kind of licensing. Is this only for Docker desktop? Yeah. Yes. But think if that's a, that's a development environment. 
So is so is the command line tool. Like it, it, I, I I just do not understand why they don't think developers are just going to use the command line. It it, it doesn't make sense to me, right? Uh, especially because you have. Well, it it says. Uh, and continues to allow free use of all of its components, including Docker CLI, Docker Composed, uh, Docker Hub, and Docker Official Images. Right? I'm I'm saying, what Docker is actually bleeding money on besides developers and maintainers and marketers and business people? Right? Is there they're paying for the infrastructure and they're paying for the bandwidth and they're paying for all of the the uh, management and 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 support that comes along with Docker Hub being the place to get container images. I mean, bar none, it is totally. the place to get container images. Where's the Podman container registry? Right. Nobody knows, right? You go to the where's where you know where's your Docker Hub? Like that's that's, that's is, where right. you go to to get images. So I don't see why they aren't monetizing that because that is something people need. Um, Docker desktop is not something right. I've ever used. It's not something I no. think you've ever used. And I just, and it just becomes ugly to, to try to, to track right. them here. Right. And it's just, it's just not in the spirit of open open sourciness if you would or you know it, it at least it's not in the the spirit of being a good steward of the community it it just doesn't it doesn't make sense to it it doesn't make sense not to me um because i mean we we go right on to the next art news article i mean we we were talking about the 30 years of of linux mark and if you're subscribed to any other podcast you know i'm way behind the times on this because this was you know the 25th of august so this was a while ago but you know there's there's a lot of people coming out and saying all right this is linux 30 year anniversary you know how can we capitalize and get clickbait articles sure. based off of that but i think the register does a really good job uh, going over it and uh, uh, with with a good take too uh, because it, it says the operating system was successful because of how it was licensed um according to red hat but not only red hat but linux as well because the uh the article quotes linus here and he says i actually originally released linux with complete sources under a non-GPL copyright that was actually much more restrictive than the GPL. Now, this is interesting, and this is where a lot of people who are set in the old ways of thinking copyright don't understand how this is restrictive, right? Um, they would actually probably see this as the exact opposite because it did require that all sources always be available, and it also didn't allow any money to be exchanged for Linux at all. Some people would say, oh, that's such a, you know, right. out of left field kind of copyright. That's, that's completely crazy. Uh, and, and here he says, you know, that original copyright was mainly a reaction against the operating system I'd been trying to use before Linux, so Minix. Um, but it had been too limited and in my opinion, too expensive. So when I made Linux, I wanted it to be easily available with full sources and did not want it to be too expensive for anybody. Uh, he does say, though, here that I changed the copyright to the GPL within roughly half a year, uh, and it quickly became evident that my original copyright was so restricted that it prohibited some entirely valid uses. Making Linux GPL was definitely the best thing I ever did. And look at the entire ecosystem right. that Linux enables. And this is a perfect example of growing the pie. Right. This, this kind of open source mentality of we're going to bring people in here, not because, you know, it's the right thing to do, even though it is not because it's the cheap thing to do, even though it is right. We're going to we're going to bring people in here because it's, you know, it's the easy onboarding. Right. It's the it's the ease of use. It's the let's get up and start it and make cool stuff. Turns out when you incentivize people, they want to right. make cool stuff. I, I don't necessarily believe in a post scarcity society like, you know, Star Trek and Vision, but I think they got w one thing right, right? Even in a post scarcity society, people will still have motivations. Like people still want to do cool things. And, and that's 
a lot of the heart of the matter, right, is is that people want to do cool things. And we can get into, you know, why people want to do cool things, you know, the whole meritocracy right. and, and competence hierarchy and, and stuff like that. But you, you get down into it. People do want to make cool stuff. And this is just the easiest way to do it. Putting up artificial barriers in, you know, that that people have to overcome, you know, it it is a mental light bulb switch, right? As soon as you you tear down those barriers, you're you're able to see all of the cool things you can do. You're not stuck on the okay, I gotta pay, you know, nineteen ninety nine mm-hmm. once a month for the next two years and you, nobody wants to care about that. Nobody wants to care about that, right? Open source is open source. Um, GPL is, is a great one. MIT is another great license. Um, I, I just think this kind of mentality is what grows the pie. Uh, it's what brings us cool things, uh, sets good standards, good precedents. Uh, I, I, I think this is, and it's, it's provably the right way to do it because we've, we've seen that it works. Uh, so it's, it's really cool. Uh, obviously, thirty years That's is awesome. yeah. super long. I mean, it it came out one year before I was born, um, so that was I'm getting up there <laughs> as well. But it's it's really cool to see that you know even after all that, it's still going so strong, right? You still see so much momentum and so many cool things uh, coming coming into the, the 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 kernel and what it's enabling and you know all these new things like uh ebpf yeah. you know the just the 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 underlying uh packet filter uh technology that's coming through containerization is fairly recent as well i mean we're, we're still getting really cool new features and when you set out to build a big system like that that's the kind of mentality you want to have you want to look down the road and say all right let me lay a solid foundation so that I can do cool things in the future, right? I'm going to make sure stuff is technically correct. So when I want to implement something that's going to be awesome, I'm not running licensing into right. barriers to, yeah, licensing issues is, is a huge one um, or any other barrier. So I'm, I'm, I'm loving this. I'm, I'm loving being on the right side of history on this one for sure, for sure. Um, and and speaking about the right side of history, I mean, we see Nextcloud. Uh, you know, much like you were talking about Rundeck last episode, it continues to surge ahead with all these these cool features and enhancements and everything that's coming down the pipe there. So why don't yeah, you so you give us a rundown of uh, Nextcloud Sync 2.0? It's sweet, it's all, and uh, <laughs> it brings it's bringing 10x speed to uh syncing from clients so i actually tried it out today i looked up a ton of pictures and uh you know a lot of these files are small you know they're one meg less than a meg and if that if i use that 1.0 sync it just would have ended up being a whole lot slower because it's next cloud for some next cloud one one the one x series that they had it didn't like small it didn't like uploading small files it really liked syncing larger files and that's where the speed was handled but with this 2.0 uh the sync 2.0 here basically they have this great graph that shows their speeds across file sizes so they have uh across the bottom they have the average file size and it goes from one kilobyte to 100 meg and with 1.0 with their sync 1.0 you see at one kilobyte it's slow it's dirt slow it's at about zero megs a second on the upload uh, and then 10, it you're still under five. 100, you're still under five. And then five, y- you know, right around a meg, you're still under five megabytes per second for the upload, which if you're uploading a ton of photos, like I was trying to do just to test this out, it's going to take a lot longer than their new engine, which runs at a constant 20 megs a second. So if you look at it, rather than it, you know, for any file over 10 meg, it runs the same now for basically anything that's being uploaded you're getting nearly consistent speeds across the board and if i'm reading this correctly that's because of this uh file packing feature yeah uh where they're taking uh upload multiple small files in a single request so you're actually lowering the load on the server right because the number of connections that you're you're opening for the files that you're uploading you're not opening a thousand right 
right a thousand connections for for a thousand files you're 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 chunking them basically you're 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 packing them uh into these uh these requests and then uploading them to the server all in one request which is perfect i mean you know taking yeah it's you're getting two birds kind of one stone here you're getting the uh, user side for speed and then you're also reducing server load so i think they benchmarked it with uh multiple users at the same time and they just said the performance was I have 10x here, uh, but they they tested it out between three to six users per instance, and I think it was the speed was dramatically increased. I, I don't know if it was yeah. 10x. I don't I don't have the number right yeah, in front and, of me, but and this is yeah, and this is actually in addition to their high performance backend for files that we talked about a couple episodes ago, which also 10x the performance, right? right? So. 10x by 10x is 100x, right? Uh, and and really cool here, uh, internal t- testing, they say, shows that in most situations, the sync speed will now simply be limited by the bandwidth of the network connection of the user. Yeah. And that is what you want to hear. Awesome. That is yeah. perfect. Idle load of the server decreased by 10x. Um, while during syncing, the number of connections is also reduced by about a factor of 10. So uh, great stuff here. I'd love to see it. Yep. And then just moving right along here through news, Firefly 3 on the move. So they posted in Reddit, actually, uh, where they're going to be, where their new communities are going to be. And like we kind of mentioned, I think, last episode of the episode before, uh, they're moving from Reddit. They're moving towards uh GitHub discussions for qu- so I'm gonna read it off here. They have a, a list here. So they have GitHub GitHub discussions for questions and support. Uh, they have Gitter for a good chat and quick answer. Basically, just a chat service there uh, for access to you know the developer. I don't I don't know his name right in front of me. Uh, they have GitHub issues for bugs and issues. They have Twitter here for news and updates. And then if you want to contribute to the project monetarily, he is on patreon there uh, and then it kind of gets into why the changes and really i think we already hashed this out uh last episode of the episode before but he just said he doesn't like pl- he he didn't like reddit where the platform was going i uh, kind of mentioned it turning into a big social media site which he didn't really like well i i, I like what he laid out here it was really really succinct Um, He said, Reddit's new strategy is not meant for vanilla users like us. We don't click advertisements. We use the old layout and we want to talk, not scroll videos. Fine. That's very interesting. And I totally agree with him. So I know that uh, Gitter.im is powered by Matrix. So that's cool. Uh, so that may be something we may be able to, I don't know if it's bridged or whatever, but, you know, access through, through our regular yeah. matrix clients. I don't know if we just have to connect to a different home server or what have you, but um, that's pretty cool. Um, I will have to go through Bookstack and update the documentation on Firefly 3 to reflect this, but... Um, uh, he does say that he's going to limit the people who can post, effectively stopping it from growing without removing or canceling existing posts and knowledge. So he's he's just archiving it. So uh, very cool. Very cool. Yep. And then jumping into this uh, next one here, speaking of Bookstack, uh, they did have a security release. Uh, I just wanted to mention that. I didn't have any news on it. It, it, it sounded, Dan Brown, pretty pretty dangerous. It looked like there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability that was uh, exposed, and this mitigates against those. So we'll be updating that. He says our... that you sh- you should update as soon as yeah. possible if you allow untrusted users to edit content in your instance, um, which means that only someone who can log in and edit access or edit a page. Um, can exploit this. So as long as you restrict who can edit the page and it's not some employee that you're going to fire in the next week and they know this, uh, you should be you, you should have mitigating controls in place for that. And then that's the last one I had. I did see here 
Ansible Fest 2021 is happening coming up here end of September. Did you want to touch on that one? Yeah, it's it's uh, going to be virtual again. Uh, and it is it has a, a ton of talks with a ton of different speakers talking about a ton of different things. Uh, so obviously, we use Ansible quite heavily uh, in our Compose. Uh, and this is something, this is an ecosystem I'm fairly, f- fairly well invested to in. Uh, so I, I will definitely be uh, in there. I don't know what talks I'm at. Um, I just got the email a bit ago to set up my uh, my agenda for what talks I wanted to attend uh, and stuff like that. So the full schedule's out there, um, and then I just got to go through and pick which ones I want to be reminded about. So uh, see which ones. I, and, you know, talks are always hit and miss. It's, it's weird because usually something like this I would be listening to at 2.5x speed yeah. in a podcast podcatcher. So sitting back and, and being a live event, I would be interested to see how their engagement goes, like what, what their chat is like. Um, I don't see a lot of events like this where people are really invited to have meaningful engagement with the hosts. Um, so I, I, I hope something like that is able to break through like besides a Q and a at the very end. Right. Because that's what virtual allows you to do. You can interact Directly. with chat. Right. Like, and, and that's, that's, that's why I'm, you know, loving the, the Twitch experience um, is because, you know, you, we, we get to do that, but not, not having that for some of these kind of bigger things. I think they're really missing out on the opportunity. Like, what does it actually mean to switch to virtual conferences? Right. It means you're not just getting, sitting up on a stage talking, talking hour, to an right. audience anymore. Right. There's, there's a lot more engagement. There, there's a lot more types of engagement that you can have at your disposal that you can use. And I, I don't see people using it. Obviously, Red Hat is going to be a big entrenched in its own, you know, right. uh, classic. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're going to be following the norms for a while, but I would, I would hope to see a broader push into modernizing some of virtual these conferences. Yeah. yeah. These virtual conferences, because they can get a lot cooler, right. Instead of like, you know, nudging the person to your left, you know, talking, talking to them during the, the presentation or, you know, just taking notes for yourself. You can, collaborative right. note taking right or you know d- d- interactive chat or you know d- with with moderators i mean like if if you're going to have a virtual conference have a have a panel and have five people in chat have one person who knows right who knows branch out try new things i mean come on guys we've been at this for a year and a half we know it's not going away anymore right because the the the, the you know the the thing that let us here all the events that that let us here right that rationale that that got us here is not going to be going away anytime soon right all of the arguments that put us into lockdown are right. still present and have no signs of of stopping right therefore let's start to get innovative actually innovative with this stuff and see what we can do um but content wise, there's nothing better than what I've seen coming out of uh, Ansible Fest. And, and yeah, they're going to post all this stuff on YouTube later too. So if you I do want to go back right. and watch it at two, yeah. 2.5x speed, yeah. I can do that too. Yeah, that's interesting that you bring that up though, because I, I, th- I think the same thing. I don't really want to listen to a talk now. I kind of want it to go to the, like you said, the Twitch format of, all right, this can be way more interactive than just talking for 45 30 45 minutes and then having q a at the end you can actually watch the chat as you go through either material or you know what have you as you kind of go through you can answer questions just on the fly address comments and walk through everything as you're going it can be a lot more interactive than basically a presentation exactly so i hope they do i hope they figure something out because i i i I certainly don't have all of the ideas and I would love for someone else to come up with a better idea than mine. 
I'm going to let you move on to the R-Compose development okay. section because I have another one I want to put in there that I'm going to do while you okay. talk about the local and run deck execution yeah, abstraction. Yeah, so this change, talk about, sp- talk about scope creep. Um, this one turned into uh, you know communicating with the sockets, doing a lot of socket work with the local... Uh, execution and portal. So basically we're able to run health checks. We were running them from run deck. We'd make a call out to the run deck server, have the run deck server, make a call using Ansible on the host, and then go back and pull that data from portal, pulling it from run deck. So basically there was almost three or four levels of communication there. So now instead of that, we have uh, this abstraction layer for local execution of uh, right now, it's just health checks. So instead of going out to run deck, making a call, it just goes directly to the socket, makes a call on the socket and says, hey, look, I need you to run these Ansible commands on the instance and let me know what the service statuses are. And so our goal here with this is to be able to run Ansible playbooks, you know, run compositional rule, run health checks, run, you know, we're not going to be able to run migrations, but run a lot of these uh, commands and playbooks directly from the instance rather than having to make a call out to say a third party service. And I think with this abstraction layer, we now have that ability to say, all right, where are we going to make the call? Do we want to make it locally or do we want to make it on run deck? And that, that's kind of what this portal level has helped us out with. And this is kind of getting into our Q4 goal of being able to provide, uh, an R composed instance that's fully, um, self-hosted. So exciting changes and moves forward here. Uh, definitely looking forward to seeing, you know, what else comes from this local abstraction. So if you, it, I will say if you do have anything uh, that you would like to see or run on your instance, just reach out, drop us a line on rcompose.com. But that's all I had for that one. What about portal logs and filtering out the health checks? I'll yeah, put yeah, that yeah. So that's that's I know another one. That so, as well. uh, that one's a quick, one, quick and dirty one. So we do run health checks every, I think it's five. Se- I think uh, Docker runs health checks every five seconds or every second or something, something absolutely crazy. It's like five, five ten or seconds, ten seconds. Yeah. Which, if you look at the logs, uh, what you end up seeing on the nginx service logs is just a ton of curl requests and you know wget requests. So right now, basically, what we've done is just filtered out all of those local logs anything from curl and though you get just it it just drops it doesn't you you do not have the ability to see them so now you're able to see proxy logs that are real users i'll call them uh rather than just robot users but you know again with this we're working towards providing a better dashboard for showing logs and with that we are going to be able to show the ability have the ability to show all the logs and filter by you know ip address location and um you know browser type who's using mobile who's using a browser and all that great information but for right now uh that was a quick quick dirty one uh just to remove all the uh local requests uh from curl and wget on the on the instance just to filter those out yeah yeah uh, and that that hopefully should be actually helpful for when you're going through and and, and trying to see what happened because we, we don't we don't care about logging health checks yeah and hopefully you know going forward we can we can turn that into an an actual type of filtering mechanism right and and being able to filter uh, other things beyond that but for the time being uh, that was great to get implemented so happy to happy to clean that up have that have that cleaned up um, so a couple other things on my end here as I finish doing what I should have done in the show notes before uh, the f- two I wanted to highlight actually three I wanted to highlight here uh, the first one is that uh, we are compliant I would say with uh, Google's requirements for podcasts um, we just got a, a heads up email that Google's going to be deprecating 
Um, they said enforcing updated information requirements for all podcasts. We meet all those requirements. Uh, and actually in going through that, uh, like literally the day I was doing those checks, I got an email from Amazon and Amazon said, Hey, by the way, we're expanding into podcasts. So do you want to add your, do yeah. you want us to add your podcast? And I was like, yes, please. So we are now available on Amazon podcasts as well. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I don't know anyone who gets their podcast from Amazon, but if you do going forward, you can certainly get ours as well. Uh, the next one is somewhat of a internal uh, tooling thing, but the completed complexity plugin uh, that I maintain uh, was updated, adding a day of the week filter. So now we can choose uh, what day it starts. Previously, it was hard-coded to Sunday, and now you can just choose whatever day you want it to start and end on, whether you want to start on Monday, start on Sunday, start on yeah. Thursday, because that's the day nothing happens, whatever. Whatever makes it consistent for you and gives you better reporting, now you have that uh, tweak ability there as well. And there's much more coming down the pipe uh, as far as that plugin goes, because that's a lot of what we base our right. estimates around. Uh, and then lastly, I want to save this for last. We are now maintaining a demo instance of our latest stable version out on the wild world of the internet with a default login user and password. So we have uh, demo.rcompose.com is up and running. It gets wiped clean at the end of each day. And that is available for anyone to log into and play around with. It has all of our services running on it. Uh, and it is running the latest stable right now. That is 3.0. So uh, any new updates would be reflected in there as well. Uh, but that is a, a good place not only for us to point people who have questions about how it works and what it actually looks like and what does it do. We can point them to that um, and which we can know is handled, you know, automatically for us. It's handled, you know, in an automated fashion. So I don't have to care about it each and every day, log in and refresh. Right. And, um, you know, having, having written that script, that's now, that's now running and, and, and doing its thing. Uh, so if, if you still haven't uh, thought about Spin Up Bar Composer, or you're still confused, like what what is Portal? And you know, I thought they were just hosting websites for me. Go go log in with the default username and password. Explore some of the services. Take a look at the logs. I mean, there's there's plenty of stuff out there for you to get your hands on uh, to see to to kind of understand viscerally uh, how this works, right? Uh, and this is this is a lot of what Jack and I ran into while we were researching this particular market segment. Uh, that a lot of the uh, other uh, products in this market segment uh, had demo instances because I mean that makes right. sense. If you're running a server, let's let's have a demo of the server that that cleans itself and and uh, you know the ability just having the ability to do that says a lot about the maturity of the system. So I'm really happy that we could integrate that uh, and it's looking like it's running pretty well. Yeah, it's it's running great. I was uh, actually on it the other day just checking it out checking out bitwarden uh running i don't know I, I don't know if i'd call them tests but uh just making sure everything was working okay yeah we've got some exciting stuff out there i'm very happy with the demo and then um we i, I don't want to skip it here i know you have the integration discussion up but there was another integration video posted that i did want to mention i don't know if we wanted to include that now i can throw it in the uh the Arcompose developments i can throw a link in there yeah yeah why don't you because it, it directly ties back to what we talked about in our last integration discussion on the podcast. Yeah, so this one was uh, mostly around organizations, collections, and then the uh, Bitward and Send that uh, Andrew did a, a great job with this one. Uh, this one stuck out. I don't know why. Uh, just thought it was very well done. But um, go check it out if you haven't seen it. Um, it covers kind of what we talked about last last episode with i already said it you know collections organizations and full uh, there was folders in there and then really i like to send there with the i think it was demo password or test password so i'd recommend checking it out yeah uh, and, and and those are really fun t those are really fun to produce too uh, so i always i always enjoy putting those together 
slaving away over my video editor. <laughs> Before we started the podcast today, Andrew did had mentioned uh, you should you should see how many takes how many cuts it takes me or how many takes it takes me to get out uh, the script for these, and I can only imagine. <laughs> so a lot of hard work goes into those. So and thought this one was well done. Just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as much hard work as I mean, you know, you and I put into this this podcast as well. So I think I think we are both uh, proud of what we put out. Right. We want to make sure it's up to a, a certain standard, um, something that's uh, usable. Right. Uh, right. We I mean, we, we put out our, our intro vids our you know, our if you would, our quote unquote sales and marketing videos, you know, our here's our compose and it makes your life better. Now research us, you know, kind of, kind of videos. And, and I definitely want to make more content that is yeah. actually helpful. Right. Uh, and, and I might even start grouping it differently. So like having our Bitwarden videos all in, all in one, having our Camboard uh, videos all in one playlist, or I, I, I don't know, but I think, uh, I, I think it is something good. It, it is actually helped me previously. I was like, oh yeah, by the way, you had a question about Bitworn. I just did a yeah. video like yeah. a couple of weeks on what you, you said. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk you through it and then go to the video and you're kind of, kind of understand. And then you get to see it and it's explained to you and you get to visualize the videos right there. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully that helps. And, and, uh, I have a feeling that I will be putting out a, another video, uh, about user management because that, that kind of fits the, the pattern here because, uh, turns out that's what we're going to be talking about today, uh, in our integration session. We're going to be talking about user management. So we do have a chapter in all of our books within our book stack documentation. Uh, for all of our services entitled user management. User management is common across most of our services that are offered under our Compose and Bitwarden or yeah, Bitwarden is no exception. Uh, so I broke it up into two sections here. Uh, the first was administrative management and the second was inviting users. So uh, inviting users just turned into such a big um, topic that I wanted to, to cover, uh, with a, you know, in, in as much detail as, as I needed to. So I wanted to make sure to split that off. Uh, and then I think today I'm going to start with administrative management and get around to inviting users after I go over, uh, what admins can do, uh, with users as it is. So Bitwarden has users go figure we've already talked about how the encryption works and, and how everything uh, manages itself so if if you have a somewhat accurate representation of that held in your mind you would say well what does any administrators need to do with my user and the answer is not much uh, but there are a couple things that you can make sure of so so backing up a little bit here. What I'm going to be covering is actually able to be accessed in the administrators sections or the admin section of Bitwarden. Uh, and you can get to that by appending uh, slash admin uh, to the URL. There's no link. There's no, you know, it doesn't advertise itself, but you can always get to the admin section. So this is something that Vault Warden, uh, as the backend provider, exposes uh, in order to kind of manage the the, the meta uh, aspects of the server itself. It's almost like a, a server administration. And the the reason why we started our compose, uh, well, at least I did. One of the reasons is I started looking at all these services. I wanted to have a next cloud instance. I wanted to. Uh, you know, spin up different services here and there, but I didn't necessarily want to maintain my own servers. Um, just because I, I already do that and I had plans to, to do other things. And, uh, then, then I realized that there's nothing that allows me to really tweak the aspects of the server itself while handling the underlying infrastructure for me. So like all the networking, the backups, the uh, VM updates and stuff like that. All I wanted was really the services, but I also wanted admin privileges on the services. And a lot of what people were selling were going to be a per user basis and a 
a shared infrastructure, right? Uh, so, so yes, they were MSPs in the sense that they did manage it, uh, but they did not grant that administrative rights in order to really tweak and uh, like even applications in Nextcloud. I had a preset of applications that were installed and I didn't have rights to install any further. So I'm, I'm sitting here like, well, that, that doesn't. Right. That defeats right. the entire purpose, right? Nextcloud has so many different applications, and you're telling me I can't even I can't even add stuff on there, um, much less you know edit the the time that you know my calendar is going to sync because like by default, and and this is something I implemented recently too, is that uh, I changed if you're running the calendar plugin, if you have external calendars that you're subscribed to, by default it syncs like once a day or more it, it could be like once every other day or something like that i'm like no i i add and remove all the time. stuff from my schedule yeah. all the time i need it to reflect that up to date so i changed it to something like every 20 minutes or something but that was like an occ command i had to run in in the back end right and that was something i had to to run um conditionally if that application was installed so i had to install the application i had to tweak the application and and i was able to do that all with administrator privileges right which i could not have done on any of the hosted services that i had previously researched so empowering people to be able to manage their services with that kind of power right and and don't get me wrong this is the power to mess things up Right. And I was actually just thinking about this too. And I was like, well, we should probably expose the ability to create a snapshot and roll right. back like that. That may be a good next script to, uh, to integrate into portal. So if you want to do something dangerous, you know, take a snapshot first so you can have a, roll have a quick yeah. rollback there. But, but like, like it exposing this administrative function, this isn't something that bit. Bitwarden.com provides you. This isn't something that, you know, a managed service provider like that would, you know, where, where they're using shared hosting would provide you. This is something that you can really only have if you're running your own instance. And this kind of hybrid managed service uh, that, that are composed, uh, the, the, the company, you know, compositional enterprises, what, what we host, right? We're able to expose this so you can have as much power and flexibility as you want. Now, really was it, what it does isn't, isn't a whole lot. Uh, to, to actually walk through what it does, it, it, it gives us a, a users section in the administration page. And you can see a, a, a couple of things um, in, in this kind of table from left to right, you know, just to, to name off what, what we have here. Uh, we have name and status. Um, status being like invited or verified, um, potentially disabled as well. Uh, it shows you the date that the account was created. It uh, importantly actually shows you the date it was last active. So that that's interesting as well. One of our accounts here has actually never been active because it's like the bot user account. So it's like sure, we never right. use it to log in. Uh, that and which could change, but you know, right now, never. last active is never. Whereas I can see both you and I have have been active very recently, uh, and a couple different. Uh, Blocks of information here, notably items, uh, which could be, you know, that's, that's any of your logins or cards or identities or secure notes. Interestingly enough, though, it actually excludes all the items that are shared with an organization. So, like, if we look at the, the screenshot that we have in our documentation, uh, between Jack and I, we both have five items to our, to our names a piece. Uh, I know for a fact I have like 50 some entries in my vault, but all those are shared in our organization. So actually the organization is the owner of those items, not either of our personal accounts. So it doesn't count against either of our personal accounts items. So it actually shows us having very, very <laughs> few items when in fact, those are like probably the items we set and totally forgot about because we don't even use them or something like that. But, uh, but it does exclude all the items that are shared with an organization. And we're good to organization in a second. Um, there is also a organization column here, uh, that gives us, uh, the link to what organization we're a part of. Uh, and this can actually be edited from here, like actually selecting that organization, you can select uh, what role in that organization the user has. 
the user can be changed from a owner to a manager, a manager to user, whatever the, the four tiers are there. Lastly, there are actions, and actions can be one of deauthorize session, delete user, or disable user. Uh, note that deauthorize sessions will not prompt for confirmation. The delete user and disable user, however, will. So the deauthorized session, I believe that's all of the sessions that have been are syncing currently, which it keeps track of uh, as we went over how it does its live syncing. All of those uh, sessions would be deauthorized at that point, which which means they would have to be reauthorized. Uh, so you can you can do a, a couple things with users. It's mainly managing the users that are currently there, uh, and and kicking the ones out that you don't sure. want in there right. anymore uh, because f from your regular user role, all you can see is all your stuff, right? And the organization that you're right. a part of, right? And you can manage organizations um, by going to that organization page, but you can't manage like the user's actual, like if someone signed up for my instance, I don't want signed up for my instance. How do I, how do I tell them? No, right. How do I, how do I kick them out? This page is where you would do that. This page is where you'd go to kick them out. Uh, and there is also organizations that can be managed from the next tab uh, over. There are five in the administrative section. So uh, hopping over to organizations from users, we can see that the organizations here, uh, it's even more bare bones than the users. Really, the only actionable item here is the ability to delete scary, the organization. Yep, um, it's there. You can do it. You can do it for sure. Um, and that's that's really all I have for management because a lot of it, like like we've gone over, a lot of it is self-contained, right? A lot of it is just what you're going to be managing with your own account and through your own organizations with, with other users. The interesting thing comes uh, when we talk about inviting users. So if you want to share a password with someone, you're going to want to invite them onto your Bitwarden instance. Now, we, we went over previously, you know, how to uh, how to use Bitwarden send right, if someone is not on your instance. But if you want someone on your instance, how do you do that? The trick here is figuring out how to actually get to the place to send the invite. So there, there are two locations here where you can actually invite a user. The first one is in the global admin users page, the one we were just talking about, the one accessed in the slash admin URL with the admin token. That, that page at the very bottom has an invite user section where you can enter someone's email and invite them. Now, this is going to be important in like two sections later that I'm going to go over. So in probably about three minutes, but the invite user, the primary function of that is if you are hooked up with an SMTP server, that will then send out an invite link uh, to whatever email that you put in there. Uh, and I think we may have one more Bitwarden talk uh, around advanced customization as far as including an SMTP server because there are a couple cool things here like email and password hints and inviting users and uh, a couple other things that uh, would be really nice with an SMTP server. If we don't end up doing that, then there is just under the general settings, there's a place where you can put in your SMTP server uh, information. And that is like any other service where you would hook it up to an SMTP server, you know, what's the server name, user authorization, you know, and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, in order to send email through that server. Uh, so, because Bitwarden itself doesn't have an uh, email server and we don't start off right. with one instantiated. So inviting a user just kind of creates that user account uh, or creates an invite for that user account more accurately. And that's going to be important in a second here. Uh, I did also want to mention, however, that an organization 
admin or owner uh, in the manage section of the organization can also invite a user, right? So that is the same type of invite that an admin can use. And that's kind of probably going to be easier. And, and honestly, it's going to be a little bit more sane because if you're going to invite someone to your instance, it's probably because right. you want to share a password with them. And if you want to share a password with them, the way you do that is right. with organizations. Right. So probably the, the, the easiest, most sane way to invite someone in is to invite them into your organization. Now, you can also invite, a, this is also how you invite users into your organization that are already on your Bitwarden instance. Uh, and I actually do go through that in the previous video, uh, how to invite to an organization and accepting that invite and approving, conf confirming um, the, the, the user into that organization. So uh, go ahead and go to YouTube if you don't understand how to do that. But that will also invite uh, users that are on the instance as well into that organization. Uh, so the the first question I put here in the, the the next section is as far as inviting users, right? Is how do invited users sign up? Well, that as we said depends on the SMTP server, right? If you do receive an email, uh, you'll get that message inviting them right. to the instance, right? They'll get that message inviting them to the instance. Uh, if the SMTP server is not set up, which is by default, uh, they are available to sign up on the regular create account screen, right? Because that is enabled by default. Now, the next question that logically comes up is what if registrations are disabled? Uh, and, and I'm going to quote directly from the wiki here. Uh, Even when registration is disabled, organization administrators or owners can invite users to join an organization. Uh, this also goes the same for admins, global admins. After they are invited, they can register with the invited email. So if you say, I'm going to invite Bob at rcompose.com, by the way, I hope we never have to onboard anyone named Bob because I use it in so many different examples that it would just get confusing. I'd have to name him Bob <laughs> 2 or something like that. So after we invite Bob at rcompose.com, even if we have registrations disabled, which to walk through that workflow is if you go into the create account screen and you try to create an account when registrations are disabled, you can fill out everything. The button's still active. It'll take you still to that page. You can fill out everything. You try to submit and it says this user is already active or registrations are disabled. And I was like, well, could we, could we get a <laughs> which one better? Which one? Uh, but they're not going to tell you which one. They're just going to say no. So uh, you will you will see that pop up if registrations are disabled, except in the case that the email that you're trying to register with is one that had previously been invited. So whatever the organization admin invites, if they do end up inviting Bob at rcompose.com, when Bob goes to the registration the create account and he creates that account when when bob goes and creates that account on the registration account screen he will then be able to to fill that out and it will not show the error and actually it will it will go through that that registration will go through so this invite functionality bypasses disabling registrations on the instance um, and how do you change invites? Um, the invitation organization name can be changed. Um, so like when you send out the email, what does it say there? And invitations in general can be allowed slash disallowed on the settings admin page. And on disallowing, excuse me, disallowing those invitations will prevent that behavior that we were just talking about when a user is invited, right? So as a global admin, if you don't want any of your organization right. admins to invite users, you can uncheck this and then they will not be able to invite any users. And even, you know, you're it's trying to fail. do that, that user that they tried to okay. invite was going to fail. Exactly. And that makes sense though. I mean, you probably don't want someone creating an organization out there and then just going out and as, as an admin of that group and just sending everyone and their mother invites to this instance 
and, and when it comes to that, you know, I think it's going to end up being real, realistically speaking, it's going to end up being, you know, your global admin is actually going to be similar to your org admin for the kind of instances we're spinning up at this point in time. Now down the road, it, it could definitely get into that structure where it's like, all right, well, I'm the, I'm going to be the owner of this Bitwarden application and I'm going to be the global admin for it. And I have, you know, you, so let's say finance, marketing, whoever being actual owners of their organization. Now you don't want your finance department going off and just sending invites to anyone who's anybody. So you're probably, I don't know. It, it sounds like this is a global setting at this point in time, but it'd be interesting to see it scoped uh, for maybe different organizations. And I, I doubt that's going to be down the road, but it would be some, it's just a, it's a cool feature, right? It's a cool feature. So, yeah, and it, at least, like I said, the 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 global admin, uh, it, you can really right. do whatever you want right. with your instance, and and this is just another just way, uh, another thing to be aware of, and to say, hey, you should you should be aware that that you can disallow invitations if that's something you would like to yeah. do. Same way that you can disallow account creation and, and sign up. Yeah, which is a uh, kind of a big one out there. I'll tell you that. Um, I mean, after after going through Bitwarden, and they do actually say it on the the wiki, you know, the the what is this threat vector? Why should I care? Yada yada really, yada. You mentioned the one, and it's space. It floating file. Yeah, it's space, and 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 there's there's really nothing else. Uh, they they downplay it as well. Uh, that, however, I mean that that may be something that I want to do, right? And and say, look, whoever signs up, invite whoever you want, um, or change signups to to be active that may be a a default that we change uh, as as a result of this discussion and you know i'm more than willing to change stuff to make it saner right. to make it more secure and if we do you'll hear about it on this podcast uh, just like you'll hear jack uh, lead our discussion today about the agile manifesto i'll tell you what it was uh one step forward, two steps back here. Uh, we're going back in time. We should have started. We should have opened with Agile Manifesto. We jumped into, we jumped right into Scrum, and you know, Scrum is the application. I would say of Agile. Agile being, oh, well, I, now I want to call it the framework. Agile being the underlying kind of concept, with Scrum being the frame, the framework to follow into this Agile. But I did want to talk about where Agile came from. So the Agile Manifesto, I love it. I got the manifesto out there. Uh, a little bit about the principles behind the manifesto because the manifesto is very kind of open-ended, I'll say. And then a little bit uh, an Atlassian like little blurb there about is it still a thing? And then I did have a link to some research on Scrum, but I just discarded it all. All you need to know from the article here uh, that I that I wiped, it's not in there, so don't look for it is that yes in fact using scrum does make you about three times faster uh, than you know the waterfall method so if you want the link um it's out there uh we don't have it linked in the show notes but jumping into the agile manifesto here what a tease jumping into the manifesto it i i really don't know how they did this a bunch of developers and I guess people who just wanted to make software development better got together in, oh shoot, I'm going to find it here. It was at a ski lodge. What, the 90s? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, of course it was the 90s. Oh. <laughs> of course it was the 90s. Uh, no, 2001. <laughs> so it, they were at a ski lodge and they were uh, asking themselves basically, how can we do better? How can we, I don't want to say do more with less, but how can we make it faster? And I think everyone kind of had it in their mind. You know, we want to operate faster. We want to do things better. But no one really had kind of a concrete formulation of what this was. No one had really written it down. Uh, so they, these developers kind of got together. They sat down and they wrote this Agile Manifesto. So just right off the bat here, I'm going to quote, from this it's a uh, facility facilitating change is more effective than attempting to prevent it learn to trust in your ability to respond to unpredictable events it's more important than trusting in your ability to plan for disaster and getting into i think it was the first 
episode we talked about Scrum, um, we talked about that FBI situation where, you know, you they they wanted to plan out everything from start start to end. They wanted to do everything uh, with thousand page documents, budgets, and realistically, it's just infeasible. Is kind of what it boils down to. There's going to be stuff that happens with your plan. Change is going to happen. You just have to kind of embrace it. Is kind of where Agile is getting at. But the manifesto kind of. I'm just going to read through it right here. Uh, manifesto fire agile software development. So it starts with, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it through this. We have come to value Then it kind of dives into their values here. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. Those are the four. And that is, while uh, there's value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So if you look at their website, they actually have the ones in the left in bold, and then they have the ones on the right, just regular regular text. But uh, my favorite here, they have uh, there's a, like a paper out there on kind of the principles, uh, and it kind of dove into. Uh, the purpose of it which i really liked because uh, they they wanted to call it at first the lightweight the lightweight manifesto (laughs) which really makes no sense (laughs) so i I like agile because it it kind of makes you think you know what you were talking about a couple episodes ago like you're gonna move quick lightweight just kind of it's air at that point um it doesn't really it doesn't mean the same as agile uh, when I, at least when I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Agile is, is, has a different connotation to it. I got a comment this week cause I was having to juggle things around and, and, and just stuff and different schedules conflicted and, and yada, yada, yada. And someone, you know, kind of complimented me. They're like, you know, thanks for being so flexible. I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, I got it from my mom. She's a cheerleader in high school. Right. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's it's one of my go tos, and 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 they loved it. They they thought that was the funniest thing ever. Uh, but I think that's part of agile as well. I mean, it, it, you you said it before. It's reacting to change, right? It's it's uh, facilitating change is more effective than attempting yeah. to prevent it. And being able to change in stride, change your priorities, change your approach, change your tooling, change your you know whatever facilitating that is going to be a lot more effective than trying to keep to a rigid right. schedule or a rigid plan. That's uh, it, that's just how people yeah. work. I mean, it, it, with, with anything, I, I really push back on a lot of the, the things that got us through the industrial revolution. Like, and, and don't get me wrong. There was a lot of benefit in there, but it, it introduced a lot of, Anti patterns, I guess, that people are are clinging on to. You know that that people can can do and have to do right. an eight hour work week. That people work in shifts. That people work. You know different different ways that people work that ha- have have been ingrained for some reason into our modern society where where the birth of it really was. You know, moving away from a sprawling, uh, you know, kind of. What do you want to call it? Just a a, a yeah. farm kind of on, on the farm, you know, do, thing, yeah. doing your own thing on your own land into into more urbanization, right? And 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 you see that coming in here. There there was a lot of advantages to to doing stuff, right? In in that kind of manner, but a lot of the the principles at the top stayed the same. A lot of what people did uh, when they were negotiating business deals and, and making deals at the top and, and planning out different production, right? As, as far as like those, those levels of, you know, the, the Carnegie level of, uh, p- problems, right? Those, those right. were the same kind of problems where, where people had to work with other people and people had to, uh, either work long hours or work not at all. You know, they, they had this, this flexibility up there, right? Whereas, Unfortunately, if you, you you look down at the the factories, those were able to turn stuff out in a lot more mechanistic type of way. And a lot of what knowledge work is, 
is abstracting that that mechanistic type of of working into automation or other types of of ways to to get things done with fewer resources and that frees you to act more like a a intelligent you know uh, economic yeah. man and you know homo I've- economicus right and, and 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 you're able to deal with that that scarcity that's not your time and energy but that is is more so you know your right. decision making and- skills and facilitating change is facilitating making those and decisions. I have two points for you on that. Uh, the first one here is, sure. and they bring this up actually in, so not in the manifesto itself, but kind of in, there's a paper that's out there uh, that I linked. It's principles behind the manifesto. And the first one is that uh, people want to go out and buy software like it's a car. They want it pre-made. They want it, you know, stock, you know, basically like stock. You go, you go. You go in, you go to the store, you're like, all right, well, that car looks great. I want it. I want to buy it. I want to install it. It's like, no, 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 that's not how software works. You can't just buy it off the shelf. I mean, you can buy it off the shelf, but that's not how software development works. You're not going to walk in and just say, oh, yeah, that, you know, let's spec it out. Let's build the whole plan. And this is what we're going to get by the end. It's It doesn't work that way. And then the uh, second point was that, in fact, the Agile Manifesto addresses if you read it, manifesto for agile software development. It's not agile car building development or agile finance development. It's it's specifically they wrote it for software to address software needs. Now, that's not to say that it has been and people are trying to apply it to other areas of work. It does it I'm sure there are case studies out there that show, you know, you can do this in whatever other environment you would like to, but they wrote this specifically for software development. Um, but I love that you brought up that, you know, 1800s, we're mid industrial revolution. It's like, wait, hang on. That's a lot different than we're, we're in a lot different times now than we were 200 years ago. So we have a lot different problems. Like we, we've got a lot of problems, but they are not the same problems as before. But really, yeah, it's like you said, you know, 200 years ago, we were facing a lot of different problems. Um, so this is specifically around software development. And I think really getting more into, I don't even want to say a scientific method, but I'll say it. I think what this did is it kind of took principles that were already out there and that people already had in their mind and that were being used. And essentially what I think they did is they just took them and wrote them down on paper is what it was. They took what was already out there. They took best practices. They took, you know, what they were seeing in the industry and just said, all right, well, this is what we see. Is this what you're, they kind of got together and they said, is I'm seeing this. Are you seeing this? And it's like, oh yes. And they kind of formulated the man, this manifesto around what, you know, a loose best practice is or what, what it kind of looks like, what agile development really kind of looks like. And, and the best practices should be best practices because they lead to best results. Absolutely. This is not this. This should never be, uh, and and I love this this uh, phrase. But activity masquerading right. as accomplishment, right. right? Which is what a lot of the planning. And so if you ends look at the being. the first principle, there is our highest priority priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And you said it earlier. The hardest choice we have to make now is what's valuable. What is valuable? You have to determine, it's not how can I do it or what do I need to do? It's what is, what, how do I turn, turn value? How do I determine what is going to be valuable? Um, so they address that as actually the first principle. They have, they have quite a few principles here. I don't know if I'm going to go through all of them. I can, but basically they, that first one is just the key one. You know, how do we determine value? What is value? And then it really talks about change and embracing it, accepting it you know, how to deal with customers and, you know, we need to work, work closely with your customers because it, actually they're going to tell you what's value. They're, they're going to basically say what's valuable. And I'm not saying they're going to set priorities for you, but it, you want to be able to turn, turn something out that someone's going to be able to use. It's, it's, I'm glad you brought up that point. You know, you're not just doing work to do it. You're doing it because there's a result and there's val- something is going to come from it. There are a couple others in here. Um, 
the one I also really liked was uh, build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. It really talked about giving them all the tools and resources, you know, letting them know, Hey, you know, these are the customers go talk with them face to face, get to know them. Who are they? What do they want? Uh, determine what their needs are and, you know, really derive value from derive what they need, build a solution for it and then turn it back around and ask them, is it good? Is this what you're looking for? And it, you know, if they say no, be ready to make changes. Don't just sit there and go, all right, we're going to write another plan. That's a thousand pages long. It's like, no, 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 no. It's like, what, what do you need fit? You know, what do you need fixed? What can be fixed? Wh where are you going to see more value from us making changes or making adding value to this? Yeah. And, and be able to react in an right. agile manner, right? It, when, when something comes in, don't force it to go through a, you know, 15, 12 point right. work plan, right? Just if, if you see something that needs to get done and it needs to be prioritized, figure out how to create a system in such a way that that thing can be prioritized and worked on in an appropriate time frame. And, and that's a lot harder to do than it is to say. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's still a good thing to keep in mind as far as a, a goal to say, hey, you know what? If I can if I can create a system wherein we can start prioritizing the the instant work that comes in, as well as still leaving us time over or budgeting budgeting cycles for for us to work on improvements, yeah, absolutely. Let's let's make sure to to build. I'm excited. I'm excited to build those kind of systems, right? But it it does come back to a lot of the points that were made here. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously you see, so we've talked about scrums and, you know, this is where I would say the, the base is, where that underlying, underlying the principles kind of come from for scrum. Obviously, you know, scrum is an implementation of it. You know, at the last one here, I would say the agile manifesto, there's nothing, I would say almost 100% of it is not prescriptive. They're just kind of making statements out there. They're saying, this is what we see. This is what's out there. This is what we based it on. They didn't say, all right, well, you're going to need to do a stand up. You're going to need to do sprints. You know, you're going to need to, this is how you're going to prioritize work. This is, you know, why wit limits are a thing. It's very much just putting facts out there and stating like, all right, this is what we have. This is kind of what we've seen. This is what we believe is kind of the best or best practice out there. Um, so you have to ask 20 years later, is it still a thing? And I think if you've been following the podcast at all, you would say, yes, absolutely. Is it still a thing? It's just maybe morphed a little. Uh, when something is culture, I'm just going to read right here from it. But when something is culturally sure. important as the manifesto comes along, you might be able to reinterpret it, but there's nothing quite like the original. So instead of trying to officially update it, maybe it's best to figure out how to apply it to yourself, your team, and your organization. There were a couple statements so it's this next one actually uh that i wanted to bring up in a lot of ways the manifesto is a basis of conversation uh so wortham i think was the ceo of scrum i believe uh here's how i interpret it how do you inter how do you interpret it obviously talking about that agile manifesto all right let's how let's figure out how to work together so i i really think that's what it boils down to right there what's your understanding of these best practices what's my understanding of it all right how can we take these and come up with something that works for us is really where i see it um so i'm gonna go right down to my next point here in that vein perhaps what's important isn't one blessed document that everyone can agree in but whether or not a group of people you know from an, a team to an entire organization can apply the ideas in the manifesto to their specific situation without losing sight of its spirit. And if we can do that well, the possibilities are unlimited. Uh, so there was another quote here. I'm probably going to end up deleting it from show notes, but basically it says, if you can, if you can think it, you can do it uh, is essentially what it boils down to. But uh, I think if, if we can prioritize it, then we can do it. <laughs> that's a, that's the battle I've been fighting. But no, I, I, I certainly, I certainly agree. I mean, you're, you're, you're trying to change 20 years in 
a culture that says let's let's roll it off the assembly line into the storefront. You still see software development shops like that. There's no doubt. You see a plan, you see the plan, you see the thousand page documents and they say, oh, we're agile. And it, it's, you look at it and you go, okay, all right. And, but it's great to have if, a plan, but you do have to yeah. be reactive. You have to be able to get, okay, okay, well, this is the plan now. You know, you need the, you're going to need a plan to start off or else you're just kind of running around like monkeys, you know, just throwing bananas at each other or whatever. You need to start somewhere. You're going to have that initial plan, but things are obviously going to change is what it boils down to. And I think that's where this kind of comes in and helps out. And then Scrum, even on top of it, helping out with that. I don't know if you feel the same way or if you've seen similar. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. Yeah. And uh, for whoever's listening to this, I mean, there's a chance that, that you know someone, you have someone in your head right now who needs to hear this too you you've got you've got in your mind's eye you know the the person you want to to hear this episode um sh- share it with them uh we 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 put links to all of our episodes on our webpage uh in the show notes you can get that that direct episode link uh that'll get them here and we can we can uh onboard them right into these conversations that we're having we can go through you know we can we can bring them into uh what we're talking about with with scrum and agile you know and and go over you know what are some some sane tools and and how how do we use them well right so so share the link to this episode with them uh so we can bring them into discussions on productivity open source software all this good stuff uh and with that Uh, We hope you enjoyed this episode of our ComposeCast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.